Greetings from the UN Global Compact and welcome to the first Asia Pacific Regional Session organized by the UN Global Compact Academy. This session is part of a special series of webinars highlighting new and existing approaches to leadership in a time of global crisis. My name is Beanie Simon Hannah, and I thank you for joining us today from around the Asia Pacific region and also from other parts of the world. We have a very motivating panel, and I'd like to introduce them to you. We have with us the Under Secretary General of the Secretary of Armida Salsia Alisjabana. She was the Minister of National Development Planning and the head of the National Development Planning Agency in Indonesia for five years. She served as co-chair of the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation and was the alternate governor of the World Bank and the alternate governor of the Asian Development Bank representing the government of Indonesia. From Japan, we are joined by the chairperson and CEO of Kokusai Kogyo Company Limited, Ms. Sandra Wu. Ms. Wu has been the president of the Kokusai Kogyo Holdings Company, a spatial information consulting firm since 2009, which is the holding company of the Japan Asia Group. Ms. Wu has been a member of the board of the United Nations Global Compact since 2018. From the Philippines, we have with us Mr. Jaime Zobel de Ayala, who is at the helm of 20 different companies and is the chairman and CEO of Ayala Corp. Uh, Ayala is one of the largest business groups in the Philippines with interests in real estate, banking, telecommunications, water, power, industrial technologies, infrastructure, education, and healthcare. Apart from his responsibilities on the boards of the Ayala Group companies, Jaime is a member of various international and local business and socio sic recognized as an SDG pioneer, no, SDG no, pioneer to stay. on sustainable business strategy and operations. So welcome esteemed speakers to this webinar. But before I jump into the session, a couple of housekeeping notes that I would like to share with you. Simultaneous translation of this session is available in Japanese. You can switch to your language directly on your screen and instructions will be shared with you through the chat box. All through this webinar, you can send your questions for the panelists through the Q&A box. Some of you have also submitted your questions for our panelists at the time of registration. And we hope that many of your questions will be addressed during the discussions. If time is on our side, we will also take up some audience questions uh, addressed to our panelists, but be sure to name the speaker your question is directed at if it is not a general question. You're also welcome to say hello to us um, and let us know where you are joining from uh, through the chat box. You're welcome to engage with us uh, at the UN Global Compact on social media. The Twitter hashtag and other relevant information will be shared by the team here uh, via the chat box. So keep tweeting as we progress. Lastly, just a reminder that this event is being broadcast live and a recording of it will be uploaded onto the UNGC website. Okay, so we're all set to plunge into our discussion, the socio-economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic has been pervasive and poses unique challenges to governments, businesses, and uh, UN agencies around the world, including on how to tackle the pandemic and protect the people while managing the response and relief efforts. So I'd like to open our discussion today by asking each of our speakers first to briefly reflect on the crisis and the impact that it currently has had on your respective organizations, your employees, and the communities in the Asia Pacific region. If I could begin with the Under Secretary General Armida. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Rini. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, one, one word, yeah. I think uh, COVID-19 is, uh, is a calamity, yeah, unprecedented. 
yeah, not only for our region um, all over the world, yes? Not only health, social, economic impact is huge, significant. Yeah, so that's that's uh, my 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 take of the current situation. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Under Secretary General Armida. We'd like to move to Sandra. Would you like to add your comments here? Uh, yes. First of all, thank you for uh, having me here, and thank you for all the audience and colleagues. Uh, I just want to give a very quick update is Japan is currently under the under a declaration of emergency and uh, this declaration covers seven prefecture on April 7th and nationally on April 17th and on May 4th the emergency was extended to the end of May again nationally and so as a country we're still very much in the midst of the pandemic and my organization, uh, Koksai Kogyo, has completely switched to work from home under the declar uh, declaration of emergency. But I want to say that we have consistently acted on our own initiative ahead of the government recommendation since January. And the specific action we took are discussed in my video, which you can watch on Global Compact CEOs Taking Action video series. So I won't discuss it here. Um, as a CEO, I choose to prior prioritize three things. Uh, first of all, my workforce, both their health and livelihoods. And the second is business continuity. And the third is to be socially responsible as an organization with over 2,000 people and take every action possible to mitigate the possibility of our adding to the number of cases. And we have chosen to work from home even uh, even if it impacts productivity and come with technical challenges. We also chosen, we have chosen to accept additional costs, for example, protecting livelihoods through the pay leave for those who cannot work from home for various reasons. And we are crunching the numbers now while we are in this response phase, and we will plan for recovery, recovery based on the numbers and the data. From what I see, um, the situation in the government's response of uh, in this, uh, in in different, it's different in uh, each country. Each working under the method that fits their culture and uh, societal context. So in Japan, we are relying on individual self restraint instead of internal coercion to contain the spread of COVID. Uh, Japan society actually brought down the person to person contact rate by seventy to eighty percent in the first week of May. So I believe um, in this Japanese context, it is very important for business and the individual to take action. Uh, definitely after a government request and if possible, make your decision to start on time. I believe this is uh, the responsibility of a CEO or business leader to maintain a key sense of risk in the global context and think and act on that understanding of risk at our own initiative without waiting for government and experts' recommendation. So this is my update here. All right, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Wu. Uh, Jaime, if I could come to you, please tell us what your reactions are. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you uh, also for this invitation. Um, we had a hard lockdown here in the Philippines. Uh, this is the 57th day uh, where things uh, have basically uh, closed down. It's uh, it's an enhanced quarantine and uh, probably not that different from, from uh, many, uh, many other countries, certainly uh, comparable to many of our neighbors. So it's been, um, it's been tough. It's been tough for everyone. Um, uh, but I think the government has done the right thing in focusing on the health-related issues up front. And now we find ourselves, we're trying to balance uh, health-related issues and obviously uh, issues of, of employment and, and, and restarting an economy. Uh, within our group, we're a multi-business group, as you pointed out. Um, uh, you know, we have 72,000 staff globally, but 90 million customers. So we have responsibility both uh, as an employer and also to the many consumers that, uh, that we serve in, in, in the utilities that we handle. Um, the particular thing about uh, Greater Metro Manila as well, and something we're all sensitive to, is the fact that uh, many of our workers um, in the greater city of Manila are uh, on a no work, no pay basis. Uh, these are day laborers. And um, you know this has been very tough uh, for for large communities um, uh, within the Philippines, and so it's not been a, not been an easy time. Uh, like Sandra uh, mentioned, uh, we came up with a relief package uh, pretty much at the start uh, for our employees. Uh, we felt it was important to send them a signal 
uh, that they would be safe and that we could ride this out together and uh, make sure that they and their families were not concerned about financial matters and, and health related matters. So everybody uh, was on a work from home basis, we're under quarantine, um, but uh, the issues of, of financial relief were there. But we went beyond um, you know, the employees. Uh, uh, we have many constituencies that, um, that, that, uh, that uh, are part of our financial and, and economic uh, ecosystem. Uh, so uh, anyone who was paying rent and our buildings and the like, we basically said uh, that we would condone all this uh, for the moment until until the lockdown finished. So we worked not only on the employees, but um, also on the ecosystem of the many uh, smaller businesses that surround um, uh, our group. Um, and finally, um, one issue that's been an interesting phenomenon is I think there was a, an acute awareness among the Philippine business community up front that it would take the government a little bit of time. Uh, to get the approvals necessary from our Congress to rebalance budgets, reallocate funds, and 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 give financial support, and so um, essentially uh, our group, together with many other uh, business groups, came together very early on, and uh, put up a, a, a actually a, a very large fund um, within twenty uh, between forty eight hours uh, to essentially have a cash transfer mechanism and a voucher system uh, to get uh, vouchers. Um, uh, to the most economically vulnerable uh, communities in the greater city of Manila. They would be the hardest hit. Uh, they, they work on a daily basis. And um, this has been a massive success. We use the parish uh, system uh, of the Catholic Church in the Philippines to distribute these vouchers. And um, that was an engagement um, that took place almost naturally uh, among the Filipino community here. Um, uh, the final thought um, is that uh, out of a negative situation, has really come an embracing of, of digital technology in our country. Uh, um, out of every difficult and, and negative situation comes some positives. And I think it's been fascinating to see uh, the digital transformation of many of the products and services in our country. Um, uh, so maybe I think that uh, can serve as a summary. Uh, we, of course, uh, have been working hard uh, in hand in hand with our government uh, uh, to try and provide a, a supportive mechanism uh, for us to ride out uh, this issue, why the Department of Health takes care of the health needs of uh, 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 the employees and, and the working public. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime, and thank you, um, Ms. Wu and uh, the Under Secretary General for those very positive opening statements, uh, I must say, the key thought being to turn the negative into the positive. So let me now direct a question to the Under Secretary General, Amida. Um, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission of Asia and Pacific, UNSCAP, has released various policy briefs on the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, could you possibly share some insights into how the pandemic will impact the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals in the region? And also, what are the major red flags that uh, are there in the region which could decelerate the progress made so far? Okay, again, thank you very much, uh, Rini, for the question. Uh, if we look at the progress uh, in countries in our region, actually there has been uh, quite a lot of progress on the socioeconomic front. Poverty reduction, uh, a lot of progress in the socioeconomic uh, well-being yeah, of, of uh, the people, and also several countries, right, have also enjoyed significantly economic and social progress. Yeah, but then if we look more detailed yeah, on the SDG progress, uh, this is before COVID-19, yeah, before COVID-19 up to uh, last year. So overall, overall, the region, countries in the region are not on track for most of the SDG indicators, economic, social, and environment. Yeah. But more importantly, more importantly, on certain indicators related to, for example, inequality. Yeah, inequality on indicators of progress related on environmental management uh, uh, areas, yeah, including climate change. Yeah, you know, climate change, including uh, pollution all front, especially air pollution, including sustainable consumption and production. So therefore, yeah, with COVID-19, although we are still early yet, yeah, like uh, one, two months, yeah, but again, yeah, the impact has been very uh, devastating. Yeah. So it will become even more challenging for SDG. 
uh, to to safeguard SDG. Yeah, even there is increasing concern that progress made could be wiped out. Right, uh, decades going back. Yeah, if the situation prolonged persists, especially lockdown, economic standstill. Yeah, not to mention the the health health impact, especially especially yeah on those uh, the, the vulnerable segment of our society. Again, uh, Jamie uh, alluded earlier on the informal sector, uh, women, migrant worker, yeah. But but again, I think it's it's cut cut across, yeah, cut across. Uh, because of the economic stand standstill and also certain sector, certain sector may be hit hardest, like the tourism, hospitality sector, related sector, entertainment related sector, wholesale retail, although shift, yeah, some to online manufacturing because of breakdown of the value chain. Yeah, and, and also uh, country wise, yeah. Country-wise, if the country is more open uh, economically, then also the impact is is also uh, uh, hard, harder. Again, yeah, we uh, again in our brief policy brief, yeah, we outline that the impact of SMEs, connectivity, yeah, connectivity, transport, logistic, and so on, job loss, unemployment, certainly, yeah, huge, huge, and definitely on poverty in which we actually made significant progress so question is how to safeguard yeah again as uh, many countries already already yeah uh, uh, implement this all this uh, safeguard social social assistance but not not um, you know um, maybe you know, need to scale up further so one one issue yeah take away uh, with regard to policy implication is to strengthen the social protection aligned with the health healthcare system yeah not only for now but to prepare better for future and again to shift yeah how to prepare better on this digitalization and and so on but last last is uh, uh, again uh, I've, I've, been, I've been said this at, at this beginning that we at UN yeah majority uh, like all of you you yeah, work from home but we tried our best yeah how to support how to mitigate the impact across uh, system wide system wide us at the regional level and then colleagues also working very hard at, at uh, many dimension humanitarian yeah socio economic impact and so on and so forth yeah at the country level so over to you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much, much uh, Under Secretary. Um, this has been um, quite a learning curve for all of us. Uh, uh, it's unprecedented and it's difficult for us to overcome. But I'm glad to know that you are really on the job, as it were, and you know, keeping tabs on all the red areas that uh, you flagged. So Jaime, if I could turn to you now, you're the seventh generation to lead this big conglomerate that has completed 185 years. Even with such a long history, a situation like this is really unprecedented for any company. No doubt that the closure of the vast majority of factories in the region will have a significant impact on some of the poorest and most vulnerable people working in the industry like migrant workers, workers in the informal sectors, daily wages, and so on and so forth. What are some of the impacts that you're already experiencing with respect to SMEs in your supply chain? And how are you specifically working to address this issue? No, thank, thank you very much for that question. You're absolutely right. This is, uh, well, of course, it's unprecedented in its scope, uh, but it hits that uh, economically vulnerable group uh, much more acutely uh, than, than anyone else. So first you've got the day laborers and uh, that's been very tough. Uh, for example, in our construction industry, uh, we have 75,000 people who, you know, the following day uh, had no work. Uh, we've been giving them economic support um, and uh, basically riding out the interim period until the government's economic stimulus uh, comes in. Um, in the Philippines, about 60% of total annual revenues in the business sector uh, come from uh, groups that can be classified as small or medium industries. Uh, that's about 35% of gross domestic product. 
and employs about 63% of the Filipino workforce. That's a very, very important community. Um, and uh, to a certain extent, their balance sheets, their ability to survive in a period like this is much, much tighter uh, than say a large group with a bigger balance sheet. It's a very sensitive time for them and, um, and very difficult because there's just no way out of the room. There are no revenues, you can't move, you can't go out. Um, we've been working hand in hand with the government to see uh, what kind of economic uh, stimulus would be necessary to give the government credit. They're coming up um, with a fund uh, channeled through various sectors uh, to support the banking sector, who in turn is supporting these medium-sized companies through a guarantee system and uh, making it easier to give loans out. Our central bank has also created a lot of liquidity in the system, and they've indicated that they want the financial sector uh, to be able to lend at a time like this at low interest rate environment. And, um, and uh, that has been going uh, well. But at the corporate sector, groups like us that also deal with a lot of these small and medium-sized industries, we have a role uh, to play as well. Um, the three issues that are important to them are health, first of all. The second is business continuity. And uh, finally, financial support. Uh, luckily, in a group like ours, we've been able uh, to work on those three fronts. Um, we have a health group um, in, in our team, and uh, that health group has been able to come up with protocols. Um, it's been able to come up with 24 by 7 uh, telephone numbers where people can call in uh, for the community that, that surrounds us and get advice. Um, on the business continuity side, we've had telecommunication facilities that we've enabled um, across the board uh, in ways that can be bought off the shelf and people can access Wi-Fi uh, directly um, in their homes. And on the financial side, um, uh, the bank um, that is part of our group has been working hand in hand uh, to build up its portfolio of support uh, for this community. But that's just on our end. Many other uh, Philippine uh, groups are doing the same thing. And as I pointed out, various sectors of our government are also working hand in hand. Maybe the one point I wanted to make really at a time like this, which is actually quite unique, is um, this is a time for tremendous unity. Uh, both the private sector and the public sector have been working together in an unprecedented way. And if there's one thing I've learned coming out of this situation, no, it doesn't matter you know, what we do in the private sector and, or what the government does, what is important is to find a unity of purpose at a time like this. Everyone's hurting equally. Everyone's going through pain equally. And unless we all realize this is a time where we all have to work hand in hand together to address the situation, it'll be very difficult to tackle the problems at hand. Um, luckily for us, that sense of unity is very much apparent that a day doesn't go by in the Philippines where the private sector and the public sector are not having dialogues, uh, exchanging notes, seeing where we can help each other um, uh, at all different levels. Um, this is unprecedented in its scope. We've not had this kind of coordinated attempt at addressing uh, problems. And we hope the spirit of, 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 of support, of continuity uh, continues post uh, the quarantine period. The tricky thing now, of course, um, for these smaller industries and, and supporting them is how do you bring them back into the workforce in a safe way? Uh, we're spending a great deal of time within our own group uh, looking at protocols, uh, not only to bring our own employees uh, back in, how to test them. Uh, we've actually ended up investing in testing facilities ourselves and working with accredited hospitals to support them. But we're working as well to see how we can create a safe environment for the uh, medium-sized industries that also surround our group. Uh, and working, of course, hand in hand with the government to take testing up from its current level to a much higher level uh, to create the safety net, I guess, as people enter the workforce. But the key uh, message, I guess, really, I wanted to give is um, coordination, cooperation, and unity of action is key. And um, out of a difficult and painful situation, if we can call out, all come out of this in a way that's created a new sense of purpose and unity in our constituency, in our communities, then I think there's a lot we can bring out of this difficult and painful period that we can build on in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaime. Um, if I could turn to you, Ms. Wu, uh, as Jaime pointed out, that you know, in, in times of crisis like this, strong leadership, uh, the COVID-19 crisis and the economic shutdown that has um, resulted has severely tested corporate balance sheets, forcing some of the most responsible companies to make difficult choices. Um, what are the steps that are being taken uh, for the short term you know, benefits or financial needs of your company with your long term? And how do you balance this with your long term sustainability uh, commitments? Ms. Wu? Um, yeah, yes, Rainy. Uh, for sure, there's no avoiding disruption to business and the impact to the corporate. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
appear on the balance sheet. So, but for us, we do not have to shut down our business uh, as we, our work supports the smooth running. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, no problem with that. Of critical, um, because our uh, work supports the <coughs> smooth running of critical social infrastructure, but everything has slowed down and we are definitely not at the <coughs> Uh, please don't worry. I have no problem with my health. <laughs> Probably just a yes. little bit nervous, so it's maybe just, my first it's just a slow down motion for everyone. So don't no problem. Take your time. <laughs> Take your time. Breathe. You. So, uh, but I want to say that uh, yes, everything has slowed down, and we are definitely not at the hundred percent productivity. But as what I said before, uh, we are still in a very uh, emergency uh, response phase. So what we need to do now and where we are at right now is we have established the business <coughs> continuity uh, with the least uh, disruption possi uh, possible while putting the safety of the, our workforce and the community first. So I do believe in this process, communication is a key. So what we, uh, what we have taken is what we have done is, what we have done is first, uh, we need the understanding and the cooperation um, of our workforce. So in this particular crisis, COVID-19, even one positive result will shut down the entire office. So preventing the spread of COVID in the workforce <coughs> becomes a top priority for both the workforce protection and the business continuity. So we let our people know what measures are in place, such as making it possible to work from home and subsidizing the pay leave and what they need to do on their part to ensure their job security as well as the business continuity. And the second, uh, we also need the understanding and the cooperation of our clients and the business partners. So we let them know what measures we are taking to prevent infection and how we would conduct our work under this crisis so that we would continue to operate to keep the impact of this crisis at the minimum and fulfill our work in keeping the social infrastructure running smoothly. And the third, um, we, we need the understanding and cooperation of our investors, shareholders, and the bank as well. We keep them informed about our measures and the impact on our uh, PR and balance sheet transparently and also on time. I said we are in the emergency uh, response phase, but this does not mean we are just reacting to the events. Every step of the way, uh, we analyze whether what we did was correct and whether what was correct in the past is the right way for the future. So we are learning from this crisis as well, and we will apply our learning in planning our recovery and to improve our resilience as an organization long-term. So lastly, on how I'm balancing the short-term and the long-term, uh, I want to say that now the top priority, a short term, is to take action to respond to this crisis. But this action is actually help the society get over this crisis. Uh, in fact, it's part of our long-term sustainability commitment because our mission is to create a sustainable and resilient society. So dealing with this uh, short-term crisis is not compromising our long-term sustainability, uh, sustainability commitment actually is strengthening them. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Uh, and it's really important to realize and, and focus on the fact that even though it's an emergency, you're not reacting, but you're also analyzing and learning from the entire process. So coming back to the Under Secretary General, um, the, the, the Secretary General has called for a government, business and civil society to work together to address this crisis. The UN Global Compact has also shared a special appeal, uh, hashtag uniting business around a corporate response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic for all companies to take collective action to stem the outbreak through implementing the 10 principles in the areas of uh, human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. Uh, do you think, Under Secretary General, this, that this could be in sync considering their diverse interests and how does, how does business respond to and support the UN efforts? Yes, so very important in this time of crisis, urgency 
that business, uh, not only business, yeah, everybody, all of us contribute to two, two streams together. Yeah, one is to help mitigate the impact. That's first and foremost to help mitigate the impact. Yeah, which in this case, of course, yeah, jobs, jobs, yeah, because jobs, you know, if you don't have job, yeah, you 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 cannot do. Everything anything you have family you have children have to go to school and and all this uh, getting getting uh, uh, un, un, unbearable but then of course yeah with government support government support with this various stimulus yeah how then you can align yeah you of course keep business afloat first safeguard the jobs yeah as much as possible but also how to align yeah uh, the, the 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 priority uh, spending on the stimulus so that's why yeah, my point earlier very important very important yeah to strengthen the social protection align mm -hmm. with also to strengthen the healthcare system and provision yeah and then uh, then uh, people right <laughs> the, the 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 at least the health impact can be mitigated and then the jobs and so on yeah, can be also uh, mitigated second is for business also to lead to lead the way yeah on the opportunity to rebuild better to recover and and rebuild better again yeah we know this uh, dig digitalization very important so this is the time yeah for business as appropriate uh, to invest or, or to transition to tr transform quickly on the digitalization of their business some already do that that some not then that, that this there comes this issue of this di digital divide yeah where i think this is the role of government and including us here in un yeah how to facilitate yeah to close the digital divide then there is also another opportunity in the change change of lifestyles of people they want healthier lifestyle yeah so maybe a different different kind of i don't know business of opportunity yeah mm -hmm. is 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 evolving is opening up yeah food uh, i don't know yeah M many many I'm, I'm sure that the business business colleagues yeah uh, can can um uh, open up yeah, this opportunity and try to transition for some of the business. And then also opportunity, of course, in the education, healthcare system with all that supporting uh, and, and, and so on that is needed. Domestic market, if, if we see, yeah, if we see from countries around the region across the globe, Countries that have a quite large domestic market, yeah, maybe they can withstand better, yeah, so they can benefit better, and that they, they can, uh, how do you say it, yeah, uh, utilize this to recover better, because to uh, for the economy to open up, export import, you you uh, you will need time, yeah, to to uh, resume, yeah, back to normal. But if you have uh, already large domestic market, that that is another opportunity. Yeah, and then uh, uh, last, lastly, again, uh, I also second uh, uh, Jamie earlier point. Yeah, the in this region, yeah, the the tenets, yeah, the spirit of solidarity, of self help, yeah, of also taking care. Or if our neighbor, yeah, is is having this hardship and so on, this automatically, right? Uh, it, it's it's built in, yeah, like like a built in stabilizer, yeah. The built-in stabilizer uh, people uh, community in our region. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Rin. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Under Secretary General. Well, um, you know, we've, we're being joined by a lot of people from around the world. So I'd just like to remind you that you can keep tweeting um, during the session using the hashtags, uh, hashtag uniting business and hashtag COVID-19. So uh, I'd like to move to um, Jaime now. Uh, many countries in the Asia Pacific region were the first, as it were, to experience the transnational effects of COVID-19. While the region suffered adverse uh, impact, rather severe adverse impact, 
some inspiring instances of regional cooperation that even the Secretary General spoke of um, uh, and the uh, collective action that emerged from the region. Uh, these are some examples of the Asia Pacific region um, you know, that we have with us. So could you share some of that? And how have uh, you uh, or your experience been in uh, leading the private sector's response uh, with your government? No, oh, thank you, thank you very much, Rina. Uh, Rini. Um, it it, uh, it 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 certainly has brought a a, a sense of of the collective, uh, a crisis like this. Um, uh, from my perspective, it's been less about a a regional impetus, although of course there's been a great deal of sharing and learning from each other. A day doesn't go by where we don't also look at what our um, uh, partners and 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 friends uh, in other countries are doing. We learn from them, and I think that spirit of sharing is very much there. Um, where I think that sense of, of cooperation has been most apparent, certainly from my perspective, is between the public and private sector um, in the Philippines. And that sense of a, uh, a collective agenda, uh, a need to work together, uh, a reliance on, on each other has been very apparent. Our, our group, for example, um, you know, was tapped by the government, one of the first groups to basically turn what was a World Trade Center, uh, uh, a, a trade um, a floor, and, and turn it into a COVID-19 preparatory uh, hospital for the returning workers from abroad uh, into a 500 bed facility. We were able to do that in about a week and a half and worked hand in hand with the government uh, to do that. They provided the space, uh, the people to run it, but they said they needed a construction company to do that. Uh, we worked very carefully with the Red Cross. They wanted to ramp up uh, their testing capabilities in the Philippines and we helped uh, them reconstruct uh, their area uh, and turn it into a facility that was necessary for that. Um, we have also worked uh, with other uh, institutions in the Philippines and the healthcare field, two or three of them, together with the Department of Health in the Philippines and actually the Asian Development Bank to reconstitute a framework around testing, uh, agree how we could ramp it up and bring resources to bear to the hospital system uh, to, to, and the equipment necessary uh, to ramp up testing from the 3,000 we started at uh, to 30,000 uh, people a day uh, that we would like to aim for, if not more, and, and take it up to 50,000. There was massive collaboration between the public sector, the Department of Health, uh, the public uh, hospitals, uh, the private hospitals, the private healthcare facilities, and, and, and the corporate sector uh, to help fund and quickly order the kind of testing equipment that was necessary uh, to ramp up the country's capacity to be able to test from a, a, a lowish level uh, to the kind of level that would be necessary to protect the workforce re-entering um, uh, the, 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 the formal economic sector. Um, I think that issue of a public-private partnership, that cooperation uh, between both parties has been, uh, I guess, the most apparent uh, in our country. I think many countries have been working hand in hand um, uh, with their own communities uh, uh, to address these many issues. Many of the things that Armida mentioned uh, really ring a bell here in the Philippines as well. The issue of employment has been paramount and the role of the private sector in getting that started. The issue of the digital divide, um, just so important, particularly the educational sector as people start and cannot go back to school. These young students are relying on digital frameworks uh, to be able to continue their learning. The issues of lifestyle, our own company, Armida, is, um, is, is trying to just study for the first month or two after coming out of quarantine how people's behavioral patterns are changing. The consumer may not be the consumer of the past. And um, these are all issues uh, of importance. But more than anything, uh, Rini, to go back to your question, issues of cooperation while the multi many multilateral institutions, including uh, the Asian Development Bank here in the Philippines, which has been a, a, a big presence here in the Philippines and very, very much a part of some of the solution finding taking place. More than anything, it's been this sense of, of cooperation between the public and private sector uh, that has been a, a strong driver of some of the results orientation that we've had in our country. Thank you, Jaime. Um, Sandra, if I could turn to you, uh, you know, it is said that uh, unprecedented challenges usually present opportunities uh, to think of innovative solutions and often businesses are known for their power of innovation. Can you share with us how business can reinvent and redeploy resources uh, to develop effective solutions for ensuring business continuity? Maybe you have some specific actions that your company has taken? Uh, yes, Rini. 
but before the business innovation, I think what is most important actually is to have a business continuity plan. We will need to talk about this basic thing, the BCP. I have been working with the uh, UN Office of uh, Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, for nearly 10 years. So let me draw on the language of disaster risk management. The preparedness is key to disaster risk management. It affects everything that comes afterwards. So you need to be prepared to make a good response and you need to be prepared to make a good recovery and to build back better. So for business, being prepared means having a BCP or BCM in place. But there are many business, especially the SMEs, that have not taken this basic step. And there is a ripple effect when the SMEs go down. So we need everyone to be prepared this way. But one big difference uh, of pandemics to other disasters is the difficulty in timing of going into crisis mode. Effective uh, response requires three things hand in hand, I believe. First, planning before the crisis. Second, leadership in decision making to launch the plan. And third, a management system that allows you to constantly analyze and correct course. So my company has had a BCP based on uh, an influenza scenario in place since 2011. And we had to just revise this plan in December 2019 and it has really helped us jump into action, as I described in my previous answers. This COVID crisis following SARS and Mars and other events we went through tells us that we should expect one in a hundred pandemic, pandemic events to occur at less than 10 years intervals. And at my company, we will definitely be drawing up a new plan based on COVID once things settle down. And beyond my own organization, Global Compact Network Japan's Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group has been discussing business continuity together since 2014. So during this COVID crisis, the working group is acting as an informal information sharing platform, and it is helping network member companies to collectively act ahead of the curve, particularly in deciding when to go into the crisis mode. And I, I, I do believe this is an effective solution for continuity that can be copied by local networks elsewhere. So regarding the business innovation, as Amen and the under, uh, under uh, Secretary General uh, Amiga mentioned, actually innovation is happening right now in the way we now work under this crisis from home and with less travel and so on. This emergency has provided a good opportunity to change our ways. We say that the disaster or window of opportunity to build back better. So this crisis is an opportunity to reinvent the way we work, accelerate innovation, do things differently so that we can collectively achieve decent work, inclusiveness and gender equality, climate action and sustainability. Over to you, Rini. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Um, we have a couple of questions now uh, for Jaime and for Sandra. So if I could just uh, place the question there for you and then you can decide who wants to take on this. The COVID-19 crisis is placing increased scrutiny on how companies are addressing the S, that is the social in environmental social governance or ESG. Um, investors and consumers have become more conscious of how companies are treating their employees, their suppliers, and the communities in which they operate. Ensuring their well being is also important for business continuity, as was mentioned by Sandra and by Jaime earlier. Do you think that this trend is here to stay? Are you noticing any positive changes within the business community? Jaime and Sandra, who wants to go first? Jaime, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. No, I, I think uh, massively important. Um, uh, the whole issue of a social compact uh, uh, that we all have as, as members of civil society, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a for-profit, whether you're a government employee, whether you're a local government unit, um, the community that really makes you what you are, your, your employee force, your teams, the people who go out, and, and many who are in the front line and under very difficult circumstances are, are the core of what makes you an effective institution. Uh, from our point of view, we wanted right up front, right the first day, we realized how much insecurity 
would take place, both from a health point of view and a financial point of view in their lives. Uh, I have to say we're not the only ones. I think everybody realized this. And I think as far as I can see in the Philippine business community, people understood this day one. They understood that uh, during a period like this where things just clamped down, issues, uh, insecurity, remember we're an emerging market. We don't have the support mechanisms of many developed uh, countries where, where they have uh, unemployment benefits and the like. In many cases in a country like ours, um, there is no support mechanism or large one. Uh, and so the level of insecurity is very high when, uh, when a whole economy clamps down. Um, we felt that we had to come out there and give people a, a, a sense of security uh, um, uh, in their financial well-being so that they wouldn't worry uh, as we rode out a very difficult period. I think the government has also had a role and they've tried their best uh, to start creating funds and mechanisms to give people that security. But this issue of, of a focusing on the social and understanding that this is not just about productivity and maximizing returns, this is about a community working hand in hand. Our ecosystems really now are so linked, in, particularly in the business sector. Uh, you know, as, as, as life has moved on both nationally and internationally, all our ecosystems and the business fund to be productive and bring costs down have become interlinked in ways that were unprecedented. I think it's important that all of us take pain together and build together again. Um, this sense of, 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 uh, of, of a community spirit, uh, particularly on the social side, is imperative to success. I think some countries will have more of it than others, uh, but all of us have a role in, in, in developing it and, um, and, uh, and, and building on it. And I think it's absolutely critical. It's, it's the fabric, I guess, of, of, of our communities and how we work together and building trust within those, particularly at a time of need like this, that will, that will create the foundation for success in the long term. Um, I feel it's very important and, 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 and glad that uh, uh, the question was answered. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, would you like to add any points to this? Yes, I just want to quickly add is, yes, this is the trend. As I, uh, as I just uh, uh, mentioned in my uh, answer, is this is uh, really a opportunity, a window of opportunity uh, to accelerate all this innovation, uh, all this uh, uh, ESG uh, uh, investment, uh, as well as the company mainstream, this ESG as SDG into company's business plan, as well as the running of the, of the company. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we have a question uh, coming from uh, um, there are there are lots of questions that are coming in, and I know that the team is trying to sift through those questions. But we're really, um, you know, running tight on our time uh, schedule, so we have a, about fifteen minutes now. So if I could just um, turn to the three of you, it's been really inspiring. Uh, hearing uh, all of you and the opportunities and challenges for leadership in the face of this crisis that you are facing. Um, before we close, um, I'd like to just bring all three of you in to reflect very briefly and share some final thoughts on how the current crisis can change business decisions in the future. Can the crisis be a chance to create a better economy? And how can we as business society, community, the UN all bounce back uh, from this horrible crisis and perhaps become resilient to any um, more crises that uh, you know, stand in our way uh, in the future. Um, Under Secretary General, would you like to take that on first? Okay, uh, thank you very much again, yeah. In any crisis, yeah, any crisis, uh, there is always a sort of a silver lining, silver lining. Um, you know, as 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 much as the situation, yeah, uh, is is uh, like this situation now, right? Uh, worse worse situation, but always, yeah, there is opportunity. Yeah. So I think, uh, of course, yeah. Everybody, including business, needs to 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 lead again. Yeah, uh, reiterate the point to lead uh, again uh, to take to take on the leadership and and see the opportunity going forward. Going forward, yeah. And it, uh, it is not only about investment in the physical physical infrastructure per se. Yeah, for example, uh, way forward is 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 almost for sure 
on this digital economy, digitalization. So it's not only about, okay, let's invest on uh, this uh, computer and, and, and uh, uh, network, yeah, that kind of thing, but also how to invest in the soft infrastructure, uh, the, the switch, yeah, the change of mindset, the change of behavior. Likewise, in education, e-education cannot you know, transform Okay, if we, you have the laptop, uh, children have the laptop, and then suddenly you can transform. No, then you have to change yeah? the mindset of the teacher, the way the, the teacher uh, teach, and that kind of thing. Yeah? So, so uh, you need, my, my point is you need both. The, the investment in the physical infrastructure related areas, as well as the investment in the soft infrastructure related areas. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, there is huge opportunity yeah, for business uh, in, in the future. And last point is always, always, yeah, you, you need to do this in tandem with all stakeholders, yeah, and definitely with government, with government. And again, I, I, I just want to reiterate the point, yeah, if, if countries have uh, the social protection system, social assistance system in place, and strengthen healthcare system in place. Future, future crisis, including this health pandemics. I think we are much better prepared for that. Then you need to invest, including uh, you know, in tandem with uh, uh, business and other stakeholders. Over to you, Green. Thank you. Right. Uh, if I could move to Sandra, um, would you like to respond to this? Uh, are there any um, points um, that you would add? Yes, uh, I, <clears throat> uh, from this uh, uh, COVID-19, it made me uh, think about this. Uh, uh, this crisis is like a direct result of uh, extreme globalization and connectedness in the movement of peoples and goods, and also the urbanization and the rising in equality resulting in slums, stress of our human population encouraging uh, encroaching our uh, ecosystem, uh, overproduction and overconsumption and so on. So I think this crisis is not just a call to change the business decision, it is a call to change our way of life. So as an individual, uh, as a CEO and as a Global Compact Board member, I will definitely be paying attention to this crisis and learning from it. Um, there are many practical lessons learned and things to improve, but importantly, this crisis has shown that our decision to mainstream sustainability and climate action into our business was the correct one. And we will continue to provide services that we would make communities green. And COVID will slow down our business in the near term for sure, but I believe that it will be a wake up call for many potential clients in the public and the private sector and will in fact increase their investment into resilience on the mid to long term, creating more business opportunity for us. And as a business community, I think we already have the tools in the form of the ESG principle, environmental, social, and the governance to make the right management and the investment decisions. We might need to add the resilience to the ESG principle and make it uh, ESGR. And we need to make this ESG or ESGR thinking a top priority. So this crisis is an opportunity to bring this about and as my good friend and the head of uh, UNDRR, Mami Mistori said, COVID-19 is a wake-up call. It would be a fatal mistake to reach for the snooze bottom. So I will be working with the UN Global Compact as Global Compact Board member to challenge our community to rethink our overall priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Although you are a little dark on the screen, but I think you can be the light uh, and the beacon for a lot of businesses around the world uh, with your um, you know, roadmap forward, as it were. Uh, Jaime, if I could uh, ask you to uh, add your comments, um, what are the lessons learned and what's the way forward for you? Uh, maybe uh, two, two last thoughts, Rini. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the first is an unusual one. Um, we're a group uh, that's been in business a long time. We're used to long-term planning and looking uh, very, very long-term. Uh, for the first time in my life, I'm looking very short-term, uh, and uh, I'm happy to be doing so. 
Uh, we've taken our planning process, which is generally very long. We tend to look three to five years ahead and just shrunk it. We put all those folders aside and we're looking at three phases. The first phase is how to get our employees back into the workforce in a safe way. Um, we're investing in testing equipment, testing protocols, whole new ways of looking at keeping people safe. And that's just the very short term, how to get people in as a first phase. The second phase will be to something that uh, Armida said, uh, which is um, how are people gonna start behaving? The next two months after getting people back out, we'll be really studying uh, the changes in consumer behavior, um, understanding how people have evolved, uh, how they buy, how they purchase, how they interact, uh, how they get products and services, and, and really relearn all of that and, and see if we can address it in a new way. And the final stage of our planning uh, will be the second, uh, the two last quarters of this year, we'll be taking all that information the safety of workers, the protocols necessary, how consumers are behaving and integrated into a new plan uh, to see how we behave moving forward. So I just wanted to leave what, that last thought that the short term has become more important than the long term in our lives at this point in time. And uh, the second point uh, to bring closure uh, goes to things that Sandra has been saying about uh, resilience. Uh, we're um, a proud member of the Global Compact um, of the United Nations. We're also uh, big supporters of the Sustainable Development Goals of, of the UN. If there is, ever there is a time for us uh, to look at all the issues uh, that basically blend our objectives and make them part and parcel of the social and economic development of the country it is now. Um, this has shown how vulnerable we all are. I think Sandra's words of, of the importance of resilience moving out is vastly important. How we create a, a, a sense of community among all of us and how we all work hand in hand uh, to create the right kind of environment for success, whether you're in the nonprofit sector, the profit sector, the government, um, all of us have a stake uh, in this together. And I think that's very much in the spirit of what the sustainable development goals, I guess, of the UN has tried to create. Um, if ever there's a time to basically reflect on the way we've all been doing things and, and, and reflecting on the kind of world we want to create, it is now. And I think many great lessons from all, all, all that we have learned, even though we're going through a difficult time, uh, there's a great deal we can learn from all of this and, and, and bring us out of here in a more unified way, a more resilient way, as Sandra says, and, uh, and a more sustainable way, as, as Armida has pointed out. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jaime, uh, Sandra, and the Under Secretary General. We're reaching the end of our session, uh, and most of you have mentioned how various stakeholders are coming together to mobilize action on the ground. I want to mention here that the UN Global Compact's local networks uh, are in 68 countries, 14 of which are in the Asia Pacific region, and they've really been at the forefront of mobilizing local response and relief efforts. Global Compact local networks have launched a diverse range of local initiatives that fall under uh, these categories. Uh, activation of working groups, support of medical campaigns, strengthening of public-private partnerships, creation of leadership webinars at the national and regional levels, um, creation of um, new online resources to support companies, addressing of inquiries from businesses nationally and also uh, from abroad, and enhancing of coordination with the UN resident coordinators. So citing um, you know, a few examples here, Networks India and Malaysia are hosting a webinar series uh, that takes a deep dive on the impact of the pandemic and the actions to address these impacts. Uh, Network Japan, Sandra, you'll be happy to know, has mobilized its disaster risk reduction working group, which you're a part of, to share their knowledge with the business community. Network Bangladesh, Thailand, and Indonesia are part of a multi-stakeholder uh, effort to procure medical supplies and equipment for the communities there. Nepal has uh, fundraised for relief efforts. The Philippines is continuing to engage its stakeholders on SDGs and sustainable related, um, sustainability related issues. So a lot really is being done and I encourage all of you to connect with the local networks in the respective countries to join these efforts and to help them uh, strengthen them. So a huge thank you to our panelists for sharing your thought provoking uh, ideas and insights with us. This has given us certainly some food for thought, uh, reflection and action. 
Uh, thank you also to the audience that joins us from so many different places. Uh, if you do want to hear more about the perspectives from other regions, let me remind you that we have four other sessions today, which uh, you're all welcome to join. Um, just for you to know, these sessions cover the Middle East, Latin America, the Caribbean, Europe, and Africa. So the registration link is in the chat box. Do register and join in the conversations that take place there. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy.